For some, it might be something that happened last year. But I want you to think about the situation that you remember now so vividly. And now you're starting to remember the person's name, the person's face, the circumstances surrounding the situation. And what I want you to do this, this morning is to think about, have you forgiven them? And here's the test. If you have, or if you have not, you'll be able to clearly tell. Imagine just for a moment that that person walks through the doors of the church. And all the places are filled except for the place sitting right next to you. And that person sits down next to you. Open your eyes. What did you feel? Did you feel awkwardness? Thinking, oh boy, this is going to be awkward for the next hour that that person is sitting here next to me. Did you feel anger start to rise up? If you, if you did experience any of those things, then I'm telling you, you're dealing with the bitterness of the situation. You haven't let go of the bitterness. Open up your Bibles now to the book of Genesis chapter 37, because where I want to start this morning is with the, an amazing story of forgiveness. That's why God's story is so amazing, because it's filled with real people, real events that took place, and things that I think we can um, relate to. And in the book of Genesis, starting in verse 37, we're introduced to a young man by the name of Joseph. When we are first introduced to Joseph in Genesis chapter 37, it says that he was a youth, 17 years old. And what I want to do is quickly walk through chapters 37 through 50. Because what I want to also encourage you to do is maybe this next week, as you're thinking about, well, where should I begin reading God's Word this week? Go back to Genesis chapter 37 and read 37 through 50 this week. And be reminded about how Joseph, this young man, had this terrible thing happen to him. And yet, we're going to see what he did with that. First of all, let me give you a little bit of background with the story of Joseph. You remember his dad, don't you? His dad's name was Jacob. Jacob had a twin brother, Esau. Now you're starting to kind of remember this whole story, right? And Jacob and Esau were brothers. They were twin brothers. Esau was older than Jacob. Jacob decided, along with his mom, to take the birthright from his twin brother Esau and the family blessing. So he's taken those things away from his brother. He got blessed by his dad, and that blessing is starting to become apparent in his life. Jacob now is a grown man. He has 12 sons. These 12 sons are the forefathers to the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel. But here's a problem, all right? Out of those 12 sons that Jacob had, oh, by the way, he got a name change. His name is now also Israel. So that's confusing as you're reading through, uh, you know, the, the book of Genesis. But here he is, Jacob, also known as Israel, has 12 sons, and he has one favorite son. And he makes no secret who his favorite son is. It's Joseph. And he shows his favoritism towards his son by giving him a special garment. You remember Joseph in the coat of many colors? That was given to him by his father Jacob. Anyway, his brothers were all jealous of Joseph and his multicolored coat that their dad had given them. And to make matters worse, in Genesis chapter 37 verse 5, it says that Joseph had dreams. And when he told these dreams to his brothers, they hated him even more. You see, Joseph had visions given to him by God. And in these two dreams, God told Joseph that he would rule and that he would reign over his older brothers. So if you're Joseph's brothers and Joseph comes to you and shares this news that, hey, later on down the road, you guys are all going to worship and bow down to me and I'm going to rule over you guys. Do you think that that's going to make them very happy? And the answer is no, no it is not. And so they were upset with Joseph even more. So one day, Joseph's brothers are out watching sheep, and Joseph goes to see them, to check in on them, as his dad had commanded him to do so. And while he's there checking in with his brothers, his brothers make plans to kill him. Murder him. Really? But instead of killing him, what they decide to do is they decide to throw him in an abandoned well and leave him there to rot. 
So while these brothers were sitting down eating lunch, because I guess attempted murder makes you hungry, as they're sitting down getting ready to eat this lunch, a band of nomads comes along, and and one of them gets the great idea, well, let's not kill him. Let's just sell Joseph into slavery and get some money out of it. And so they strip Joseph down. They take off his multicolored coat that his father had given to him, and they sell Joseph to these nomads who would no doubt sell Joseph into slavery in Egypt. And so these brothers return to their father, Jacob, with Joseph's coat. And what they did is they dipped this cloak in animal's blood. And they show it to their dad. And they're like, hey, is this Joseph's coat? Maybe you can tell us. We found this out in the wilderness. And so sure enough, Jacob now assumes that Joseph is dead. So now while Joseph is in Egypt as a slave, his series of, of events are like a roller coaster. Ups and downs. First he becomes a slave, and while he's a slave, he's he's a servant, he is falsely accused of attempted rape. And so he ends up in prison. And things there, he was in there for quite a while, and they were not going great for Joseph. But in Genesis chapter 40, Joseph uses the gift that God had given him, the gift of interpreting dreams. And finally, word gets back to Pharaoh of Joseph's ability. And because Pharaoh had been having some dreams lately that no one could interpret, Joseph is now freed from prison and he's promoted. And the dream that Pharaoh is having is that famine is coming. Famine is coming to the land of Egypt. And so Joseph interprets the dream for Pharaoh. And they now have time to stock up food and to save food so that they'll be well prepared for the famine. So Joseph is promoted to second in command right below Pharaoh. And the famine is so bad now in the land, that so terrible that it even affects the land of Canaan, the promised land. And so Jacob, Israel, sends his sons to Egypt to go buy some grain. And so Joseph is the one handing out the grain to everybody who's coming to buy it. And along come his brothers. You know, the ones who tried to kill him, the ones who are responsible for selling him into slavery. Only Joseph's brothers didn't recognize him. Why? Well, it says that Joseph disguised himself, and after all, it's been nearly 15 years. 15 years since his brothers had sold him into slavery. And so here's the thing, these brothers come wanting food. And Joseph has the means and the power to give them food. What would you do? What would you do? I mean, I know a lot of us have been wronged. A lot of us have had difficulties with maybe some family members. But it's probably safe to say that your siblings or your family members never tried to put you to death. Or to sell you into slavery. Or to lie to your mom and your dad saying that you were dead. Well, here's the amazing thing. Joseph forgives them. He releases them from the debt that is owed to him. And he gives them the grain. And more astonishing than that is he invites them to come and to live in the land of Egypt. And listen to Joseph's words in chapter 50, verse 20 of Genesis. He says, As for you, you meant it as evil against me. But God meant it for good in order to bring about this present resolve and to preserve many people who are alive. How can Joseph forgive like that? More importantly, how can I forgive like that? How can you forgive like that? How many of you would say that as a Christian, if you've been a Christian for some time now, you know a little something about what the Bible has to say about forgiveness? You've accepted Jesus Christ's forgiveness for what you've done, so you know a little bit about what the Bible has to say about forgiveness. You probably couldn't teach a lesson about it or maybe stand up and give a four-hour presentation about forgiveness. But if if somebody asked you about what the Bible has to say about forgiveness, you could tell them. Well, how many of you have actually practiced forgiveness? Hey, look, if you're holding a grudge and you think you've got a good reason to hold a grudge, let me just say this, that the reasons for unforgiveness are ridiculous. The reasons for unforgiveness are ridiculous. And that may sound a little bit harsh, 
That may sound like, well, Mark, you don't know my story. You don't know my situation. And you're right. I probably don't know your story or your particular situation. But we can all be honest here this morning. As I'm preaching on forgiveness, maybe you have a situation in the back of your mind that has been haunting you ever since I mentioned the word forgiveness. And you're thinking to yourself, well, if Mark only knew the kind of deep hurt that I felt or that was suffered me, surely then he would understand that I have a reason as to why I'm not forgiving this particular person or this particular situation. You see, everyone believes that their situation justifies them to not give forgiveness. We all want to question the limits on forgiveness. Is there a person I don't have to forgive? Is there an expiration date on forgiveness? Is there a specific crime that is too much that I don't have to forgive? Is there a loophole on forgiveness? And the answer is this, no. You must forgive everyone, everything, all the time. And that's hard. There's no loophole. There's no exit ramp. There's no hall pass. We are all the same. When someone injures us, we're looking for a way out. We're all looking for an excuse. And the reasons for unforgiveness are ridiculous. See if these sound familiar to you. There's four rationales that I've heard about forgiveness. I want you to look first of all at this backpack here that I've got. Let's say that whatever thing that has been uh, harmed, whatever injury you've suffered at the hands of another, whether it was intentional or unintentional, well now you've got this big thing that's coming into your life, right? And, 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 and you decide that, you know what, for whatever reason, I'm going to refuse to forgive that person. I'm going to refuse to release the person from the debt that's owed me. And I'm going to carry this thing with me. I'm going to hold this grudge with me. And I've got some good reasons as to why I'm not going to release this grudge. See if these four reasons or these four common rationalizations that we give sound familiar to somebody. Uh, maybe you've heard someone say, well, I can't forgive because, well, it's too big. The hurt that they've caused me is too big. It's too great. To which I would say, well, that's all the more reason you don't want to be carrying that thing around. The hurt that they've caused you weighs you down. It's heavy. And even if you can't see it, you may be able to manage it for a few years. But you come to the end of your life, and as you're looking back on your life, you're going to realize, man, I was a grouch. I was a grump. My joy was robbed from me. And so don't let the excuse be, I can't forgive because it's too big, be the reason that you're not forgiving. The second rationale that sometimes people say is that I'll forgive them when they say they're sorry. I'll forgive them when they say they're sorry. I'll forgive them when the person comes to me and owns up and apologizes for what it is they've done. But until that happens, well, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to offer them the forgiveness they're seeking. Here's a newsflash. They're not coming. The person who has wronged you is not going to come and say, oops, sorry, they're not going to. And if they did come, if you were on this plan, if you were waiting and holding on to it to release it until they apologized, I've got news for you. If by God's mercy and miraculous grace, they did come and own up to the wrong that they've committed, you wouldn't be ready to forgive them. You'd be bitter. You'd blow it. Here's the third rationalization that people sometimes give. Well, I can't forgive if I can't forget. I can't forgive, I can't until I forget. And I want to let you know this morning, that's completely backwards, completely flipped around. You can't forget until you choose to forgive. You see, unforgiveness is choosing to review the offense regularly. Would it be hard for me to forget that I've got this backpack on? No. But it's when I remove this backpack, when I choose to forgive, that I'm going to forget what it even looked like. And so you can't forget until you choose to forgive. And lastly, the last rationalization that sometimes people use is, well, if I forgive, well, they'll just do it again. Right. 
all the more reason that you want to get rid of that one so that when it does happen again, you won't be burdened down with two things that are overcoming you. Just because you forgive does not mean that you've given them a license to do it again. I think we need to understand that. And that would seem to be huge motivation for getting rid of the first one. Well, what I want to do now is I want to look at the teachings of Jesus on forgiveness. Because here's the awesome thing. I think we could all agree that Jesus Christ is like the expert, expert when it comes to forgiveness. I mean, I think we could all agree that Jesus knows exactly what forgiveness looks like, how difficult it can be. Remember, Jesus, God the Son, was the one who went to the cross of Calvary to forgive everyone everything they've ever done. And so I think it's safe to say that Jesus knows a little something about forgiveness, right? Right. And so it's not surprising that Jesus has a lot to teach us about forgiveness. For those 33 years that Jesus lived on this earth, for the three years that he had ministry, he was teaching a lot about what we're supposed to do when it comes to forgiveness. In Mark chapter 11, verse 25, Jesus says, Whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father who is in heaven will also forgive you your transgressions. In Luke chapter 6, verse 37, Jesus says, Forgive, and you will be forgiven. And finally, in the Lord's Prayer, Matthew chapter 6, Jesus teaches us to pray. And you guys know it. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And what's the next part say? And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Forgive us, God, of the times we have gone where we know we shouldn't have gone, where we've violated a boundary that you put in place, where we have sinned against you, God. Forgive us of those times in the same way that we choose to forgive those who violate and cross boundaries with us. Time and time again, Jesus makes it clear. I'm forgiven the way that I forgive. And that's rather serious. So now we come to Matthew chapter 18. Open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 18. This is where we're going to be uh, once again. And Jesus is teaching. And not surprising, Jesus, in, as he's talking about forgiveness, the subject of how to handle conflict comes up. Now confession time. Has, ever, has someone ever been teaching or preaching in a place where you were at and, and you kind of stopped listening to the person who was preaching or teaching and, and kind of got stuck on something they said and you kind of went over here in your own little world for a little bit and thought about what it was they said and you totally aren't tracking anymore with what it is they've said? You ever do that? You guys do that all the time. I see it, okay? As I'm out here, I'm, you guys do it all the time. I see, you know, uh. And uh, anyway, you can totally relate to Peter then. Okay? In Matthew chapter 18, Jesus just got done saying, if anyone sins against you, you go to them and you work it out. You take somebody with you. If they don't listen, you take the elders. You take somebody in the church. You get together with them and you work it out. But then Jesus leaves that teaching point and he moves on. And there's Peter off over here thinking about that a little bit. And as soon as Jesus took a breath, Peter jumps in in verse 21 and he says, uh, Lord, how often shall my brother come against sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? I mean, this could get way out of control, Jesus. One time, maybe. Two times, okay. Three times, all right. Seven times? At some point, there has to say enough. Or otherwise, people might just take advantage of me. You see, the Pharisees, they taught that you had to forgive someone three times for the same offense. And so as Jesus is talking, Peter's thinking about what it looks like to go to someone who's wronged them. And he's thinking about what forgiveness looks like. And wanting to impress Jesus, you remember earlier on in, in, in the chapter, they're talking about who's the greatest in the kingdom. Remember that? You can look there and see that all for yourself too. And so Peter, wanting to impress those who are around him, wanting to prove that he's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, wanting to impress Jesus, takes what the Pharisees said, doubles it, and adds one. And so Peter's like, Lord, how often should I forgive my brother who sins against me? Like, seven times? I am awesome. Seven? 
And verse 22 is Jesus' response to Peter's thought. Look at it. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. What? The point that Jesus is making is not count to 490, then ding, you're out. That's not what Jesus is saying. What Jesus is saying is this, you cannot put a limit on forgiveness. You cannot put a limit on forgiveness. You see, when we're trying to view, what we're trying to do here this morning is we're trying to view forgiveness like God would have us view it. And so what Jesus is going to prescribe is not man's way, it's God's way. It's the kingdom of heaven stuff. And so Jesus tells them a story about forgiveness starting in verse 23. Jesus is like, I'm going to give you guys a heads up. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven, warning what we're about to dive into is kingdom of heaven stuff. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. And when he had begun to settle with them, one owed him 10,000 talents was brought before him. Now we get lost on the 10,000 talents. Let me, let me fill you in a little bit. A talent was a sum of money, a currency that we don't use today. But back then, one talent was worth 20 years wage. So one talent was equal to 20 years worth of work. So in our lifetime, by the time we retire, you have what? About two and a half, three talents saved up or of work put in, right? Well, this guy owed the king 10,000 talents. 10,000 talents is 200,000 years of work. What's the life expectancy again? At all estimates, the amount that was owed was simply unpayable. Verse 25. But since the man did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and his children and all that he had so that payment could be made. Now listen, even if they sold everything the guy had, family, it was not going to come close to the amount was owed. But the king was thinking, well, I'll at least get back what I can out of this guy. But did you notice in verse 25, it simply says, he could not pay. He did not have the means to pay. And I want you to know this morning that if you've been wronged, many people who've done many things to you and the ones that you love, and if you've been wronged, that person, those individuals cannot pay. There is no possible way that they can repair the damage they've done, replace what they have taken, fix what they have broken. They cannot pay without grace. Verse 26, so the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him saying, have patience with me and I will repay you everything. Now what's wrong with that statement? Well, does he not know he can't possibly repay what he owes? It was an outrageous claim this guy was making. And so take note of this, very seldom, if ever, does the person who has wronged you ever properly calculate what they owe. Let me say that again. Very seldom, if ever, does the person who sinned against you rightly calculate what they owe. And that includes you and me. Don't look for that. Don't expect that. The person who needs to be forgiven doesn't understand how much they've hurt you. And that includes you and me. So let's not spend our time here this morning thinking that we are the ones who are injured and that we are never the ones responsible for injuring somebody else. Look at verse 27. It's really an amazing verse. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. And here's where the story goes crazy. But that slave went out and he found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. Let me explain what a hundred denarii was. One hundred denarii, or one denarii was equal to as much money as you'd earn in a day. So one denarii equals one day's wage. A hundred denarii is approximately three months worth of pay. Now how many of you could live 
your life without three months worth of pay. Those of you who are working, um, you know, you probably need a paycheck. You probably couldn't just tell your boss, oh, just take three months off. You don't have to pay me. It's okay. So the point I think that Jesus is making here is he's not minimalizing the hurt that you've caused, the amount of debt that somebody owes you, the pain that they've caused you. He's not minimalizing that in any way. It's a large debt. It's a large hurt that you've experienced. But here's the thing. When compared to how much God has forgiven us, it's beans. It's nothing. And that's the point that Jesus is making. And notice what this guy does. And so he seized, seized his fellow servant and he began to choke him saying, pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him saying, have patience with me and I will repay you. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? But he was unwilling. But he was unwilling. Unwilling to do what exactly? Unwilling to forgive. And notice what he does. And he went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what was owed. Now when you choose to refuse to forgive someone, here's what you need to understand. The fallout from that is huge. The fallout from that is huge. You see, unforgiveness, your, willing, your, your unwillingness to forgive somebody, unforgiveness punishes everybody in its path, including you. And look at the fallout. As bad as the situation was with the king, he owed him an unpayable debt. The servant walked out from the king's presence, walked out a free man, forgiven of the debt. And he should have been walking a mile high. But instead, do you see what happens? He takes what he has been given, the freedom, the forgiveness, and he makes things so much worse so quick. In fact, he had an emotional meltdown. I don't know what it is, but when you have bitterness in your heart, see if this is true. I know this is true for me. When you've got bitterness in your heart, the rest of your emotions are all out of whack, aren't they? They're like all over the place. People who are bitter are grouchy, they're angry, they're negative. All of those emotions, and it doesn't take anything to see one of those emotions get just like spilled out, all right? They're all out of whack. And that's certainly true in our text. Our servant who has just been forgiven by the king, what does he do? He goes to his friend, his fellow servant, right out of prison, and he starts choking him. There was no, hey, there's some things we might need to work through, or do you by any chance have that money I, let, I borrowed you, I let you borrow? Uh, there was nothing like that. He sees them and immediately begins to choke it right out of him. And it shows that his heart had not changed. He was not impacted by the forgiveness that he had received. His behavior towards his fellow servant was proof of that very fact. So he had an emotional meltdown. Here's the second fallout that we see from our text. Shattered relationships. Bitterness shatters relationships. Look at verse 31. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved. And they came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. So now this guy, all of his relationships are falling apart. He's choking his friend. I mean, they must have been friends. You don't loan uh, a stranger that kind of money. You, they must have been friends. But now that relationship's toast. It's gone. It's broken. It's shattered. And unforgiveness always shatters relationships. And then you notice a little further down in our text, his co-workers, those people who are working alongside of him, they see this take place and they are so disgusted by what they see, they go and tell the king what he's done. You ever notice that bitterness, bitterness in your life, the bitterness that you harbor towards one individual, it seems to seep out and affect every other relationship you have in your life? Unforgiveness has great impact, not only on you and the person that you're not forgiving, but it has great impact on all the people in your life who know that you profess to be a follower of Jesus Christ and they're watching you and they're seeing that you can't let go, that you can't forgive this great offense and they think to themselves, this is what Christianity is all about? Well, these know better. Why would I need Jesus in my life? If he's acting like that. And then notice the last part of the follow-up caused by unforgiveness and it's the worst part of it all. It's uh, the humiliation before the king. 
verses 32 and 33. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? Did you notice the servant? What he says as he's standing there before the king the second time? What does he say? How does he answer verse 33? In silence. He says nothing. What could he say? Knowing what you know about the gospel and knowing what I know about the gospel, God help us if we should ever have to stand before the king and offer up the reasons and the explanations why we chose not to forgive somebody. There's nothing you could say. There's nothing that I could say. And finally, look at the last part of it. The consequences are lasting. Look at verse 34. And his Lord moved with anger and handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. You see, the consequences of you choosing not to forgive somebody affect you more than you realize. You think you're simply not ready to forgive? And I'm telling you this morning that you're not ready to hold a grudge. For the man in our text, because of his unforgiveness, his unwillingness to release somebody from the debt that was owed him, all of the blessings that he had received from the king, gone, forfeited. Back to where he started. What blessings are you missing out of because of your refusal to offer forgiveness to somebody who needs it? And finally, verse 35 is the summary for everything that Jesus had just been teaching about forgiveness. Verse 35 says this, My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. Man, those are some serious words. Who do you need to forgive? Who do you need to release from the debt they owe you? In your bulletin, you're going to notice two lines. The two, first line says, I forgive with a blank. In that blank, you need to write down the person, the name of the person. And then the second line is for, and then it details a little bit of the circumstances or uh, the name of the offense. What I want to challenge you to do is spend some time this week in prayer over that. Bring that back next Sunday. And if you forget to bring it back, we'll have it in your bulletins again. But next Sunday, we're going to talk about how to forgive. Because a lot of us in here, we're like, okay, Mark, I realize I need to forgive, I want to forgive, but I can't. It just keeps being replayed in my mind time and time again. How do I get free from that? We're going to talk about that next Sunday. But right now, what I want to do is I want to offer a time of prayer for you. And then we're going to have our time decision. And so will you please bow your heads with me in prayer and then we'll have our time decision this morning. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you. I thank you for your word, for its truth, for its power. God, as, as, as we have read your words, God, may they cut us like a knife. May we discover that it is sharper than uh, any two-edged sword. Father, this morning, I, I don't know what kind of grievance or, or what kind of difficulty, what kind of debt is owed each person here, what kind of offense they've suffered. But Father, help us to forgive. Help us to see the benefits of that forgiveness. Help us to be willing to let go of it. Help us be willing to put it at your feet. Father, remind us that we are forgiven in the same way that we forgive others. We thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you for your generosity and your grace. And Father, forgive us when we sin against you. And forgive us when we don't forgive others. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.